This podcast is brought to you by Irish Newspaper Archives, the gateway to Ireland's great historical past. A subscription to Irish Newspaper Archives gives you access to the archives of over 70 Irish newspapers, which date back nearly 300 years. In total, they have over 6 million scanned pages chronicling Irish history over the last three centuries. With their easy-to-use search engine, you can find what you're looking for in seconds from the comfort of your own home. I use it all the time when making the show. As a listener to the Irish History Podcast, you can get 30% off monthly and yearly subscriptions by going to irishnewspaperarchives.com forward slash podcast and use the coupon code POD30. So don't miss out and get this great offer by going to irishnewspaperarchives.com forward slash podcast and use the coupon code POD30. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is the Inishki Island Mysteries. There has been a big delay in getting this podcast out, apologies for that, but I have been pretty sick since the last show. I have a chronic illness that flared up, which led to hospitalisation and then actually eventually surgery. I'm slowly getting better, but all this has delayed the return to the Great Famine series. However, being laid up did give me a chance to read a bit and that's when I stumbled across the unusual story of the Inishki Islands. The lives of these islanders on what is now a lonely shore has enchanted, mystified but also unsettled writers, travellers and commentators since the early 19th century. If you do even the most basic of research into the islands, most descriptions will talk about the rugged beauty of the place but it won't take long before you encounter strange rumours of pagans and pirates who elected their own kings until the late 19th century. The more I read about the islands, the more I became intrigued and I went back to find the earliest accounts to try and make sense of these strange rumours. So in this show, I'll be looking at how did people survive in what was one of the most inhospitable places in Ireland? Were the islanders really pirates until the late 19th century? And what about these strange rumours of paganism a thousand years after the rest of Ireland converted to Christianity? Before we start, I just want to thank all the show patrons who support my work on Patreon. Their patience over the last month when the show was delayed in coming out has been amazing and I really appreciate it. It means so much. The next episode will be exclusively available only for show patrons and will be on the decline of the Inishki Islands and looks at why no one lives there today. It's an enthralling story in itself. You can get that with lots of other patron-only podcasts. My documentary, Forgotten Fields, which was released only last week, and episode guides to each show by signing up now at Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Irish podcast. As World War II broke out, the English writer, pacifist and conscientious objector, Terence Hanbury White, fled his home in England to avoid being drafted into the British Army. Moving to neutral Ireland, he would spend the war here as far from conflict zones as possible. As Poland was carved up by the Nazis in the Soviet Union in the winter of 1939, Terence White made his way across to the west coast of Ireland, and from there he pushed even farther west, crossing to the Inishki Islands in a large open canoe called a Corruk. The islands by then were uninhabited, and although warned not to stay by locals, White, like so many before him, was intrigued by the Inishki Islands and would spend a few days there around the crumbling ruins of family homes, accompanied by none save his dog, Brownie. He later recounted his experiences on that first night as he watched the Corrock pull away, leaving him behind. I felt lonely standing on the white sand in the twilight. The roars in the Corrock cried a farewell to me as they left. Then, in the quickly falling darkness... I went into the broken house on man's first duty, to make a fire. When this was burning, I set out in search for the well, but it was dark now, and the electric torch had broken somehow, so I could not find it. I went to the drinking place for cattle and got water there. I was alone, and it was midwinter. The Inishkees are islands off the west coast, once inhabited by men, but ten drowned in 1927 in what was called the Inishki disaster, and the land being too exhausted by a thousand years of sea manure to grow potatoes, had been abandoned. 
The little village stood quite silent beside its anchorage, its roofs fallen, the stones of the walls in the street. In twelve years it seems to have lost all human origin. No people were expected at its broken doors. A few black cows sheltered there at night. The seals come into the harbour. Two small blackbirds visited in the mornings. Two ravens cronked higher up. And the geese, which, driven away during man's thousand years of residence, had now returned. These evocative words could describe many islands off the west coast of Ireland, which were once inhabited, but have long since been forsaken. Many of us who live in metropolitan areas find a certain attractiveness in this solitude. However, the serene picture painted by Terence Hanbury White took a turn into what can only be described as the surreal. During his second day on Inishki, some fishermen stopped by to see how he was and advised him again to leave. White remembered, they had been afraid to leave me. They feared, perhaps, an old god of the island, venerated until the last generation. An old god of the island, worshipped until the last generation, which, when White was writing, would have been the late 19th century, seems like a flight of fancy. It's pretty hard to believe. Initially, I thought White's imagination had got the better of him, but I quickly found out he wasn't the first person to make such claims. Indeed, Inishki had, for at least a century, been at the centre of wild claims of strange goings-on there, and it wasn't just talk of pagan gods. Nearly 80 years earlier, another writer, Mark Hutton, had visited the west coast of Ireland, and standing on the coast of Achill Island, he looked north to the Inishkis on the horizon when a travel companion told him about the islands. You have heard, of course, of the piracies committed along this coast. Robberies of vessels laden with grain or coal, as the case may be. Well, the aggressors are those miserable islanders, men who are in the last stage of destitution and misery, who see their children expiring of inanition and fever before their eyes. The strange reports of island life didn't end there. In 1884, the Scottish writer Alexander Inez Shand claimed they acknowledge no landlord, pay no rates, they elect a monarch of their own. The more I read about the Yenishkis, the more they sounded like the land time forgot, an intriguing topic to research where God only knew what I might uncover. But even as my mind was thinking of evocative titles for a podcast, there was a certain scepticism rising in me about these claims. Not necessarily that the authors were outright lying, but that they were not portraying a full or accurate picture. Most of these authors had pretty extreme biases towards the islanders and island life in general. For example, Terence Hanbury White said, The people of the islands are primitive. They live in the primitive conditions of nature and were moulded by their surroundings. Indeed, his writing in general is laced with a common misleading stereotype that persists into the 21st century about places like Inishki. The west of Ireland in general is often portrayed as a land time forgot, idyllic, pure, simple, but at the same time backward, the people mysterious, the land magical, where one might find their true self away from the hustle and bustle of hectic urban life. A great example of this is the podcast series West Cork, which investigated the murder of Sophie Tuscan de Plantier. In the first episode, it portrays the southwest of Ireland as simple, mysterious and magical, where people who live stressful lives can go to find their true self. The problem with such narratives is that people native to these communities, be it West Cork or Inishki, are reduced to props in their own history and the visitor takes centre stage. The Blind Boy podcast delves into this in greater detail in his episode Jesuit Drip if you want to hear more on this. That's well worth listening to and he gives a good few examples of what I'm talking about. Armed with this scepticism, I continued my research into the Inishki Islands, trying to pick apart what was true and what was false about what seemed to be an island with a very strange and unusual history. To help you understand what I'm about to talk about, I'm going to first paint a picture of the islands so you get a sense of what they were like and what I'm talking about. If you're subscribed for episode guides on Patreon, check out the guide for this show. There's lots of maps, census data and graphs there. You can get that at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. The Inishkees consist of two islands, the North Island and the South Island. While not the most westerly point in Ireland, it could be argued they are the most remote. They are separated from the mainland by three miles of treacherous waters and in winter they are frequently cut off for weeks or in some cases months at a time by Atlantic storms. Living on the Inishkees was never easy. 
Both the North and South Island are only about two square kilometres, irregular in shape and dissected by inlets, while much of the land is not really suitable for farming. Nevertheless, over several millennia, people have repeatedly tried to establish communities on the Inishkees. What drew our prehistoric ancestors here remains a mystery, but rock carvings and tombs prove that our long-vanished people were living here up to 4,000 years ago. The first recorded settlement dates back to the early Middle Ages when Christian monks settled the islands, drawn by the isolation. This solitude proved to be their downfall, as they made easy pickings for Viking raiders who preyed on this remote and defenceless outpost. It was around the middle of the 18th century that the most recent phase of human occupation began. Over the course of several decades, a community slowly emerged, and on the eve of the Great Famine, in 1841, the population of the islands stood at 217. Remarkably, the islanders not only survived the horrors of the Great Famine, but the population actually increased, standing at 257 in 1851, reflecting an increase of 18% at a time when the population of the wider province of Connacht fell by 35%. Indeed, the famine experience of the island has been frequently used by writers to enhance the mystical nature of island life, often inferring some mystery was afoot to explain how the islanders survived the Great Famine. The answer, though, is pretty straightforward. Their diet was more diverse than on the mainland, and like many other islands, the blight which destroyed the potato crop elsewhere was less severe on the island. However, for me though, it was the rumours of paganism and piracy that intrigued me most, and I began what would end up a pretty exhaustive search through 19th century books looking for accounts of Inishki, and I actually found several. From the early 19th century, there was a major increase in the number of travellers touring the west of Ireland and writing accounts of their experiences there. Some were more adventurous than others in terms of how far into the west they ventured. Certainly before the famine, reaching places like Eris in northwest Mayo was difficult. Roads were poor, only the most intrepid visitor could reach the shores of the Mullet Peninsula in Eris to gaze out on the Inishki Islands three miles off the coast through choppy seas. Few, if any, ever ventured to the islands. Still, it was in places like Ackle Island or Eris itself where these travellers encountered strange reports of life on the Inishkees. An early example of this are the words of the Tipperary man Caesar Otway, who published an account of a journey through the West in 1841, where he heard rumours of life on the Inishkees. Otway mentioned strange beliefs and practices on the island and claimed the islanders worshipped a stone called the Naevog or Naveen. It must be said though that Otway was basing this on a third-hand account. He didn't meet anyone who had actually seen this Naevog. Were he the only one to mention this, his report would have been forgotten, but similar rumours persisted. As the Great Famine drew to a close, the third Earl of Roden, Robert Jocelyn, wrote a much more detailed account in 1851. About, About seven, seven miles, miles distant, distant from Bingham Castle, Castle in the Atlantic, Atlantic is the island of Inishgee, Inishgee, containing, I believe, about 380 inhabitants. They have very little intercourse with the mainland and the state of their spiritual darkness is deplorable. It is hardly to be credited that among the British islands heathen idolatry is to be found and that a stone carefully wrapped up in a flannel is brought out at certain periods to be adored by the inhabitants of Inishki. When a storm arises this heathen god is supplicated to send a wreck on their coast. This statement I have received from Mr Campbell and others. He told me he had himself visited the island and seen the idol in question. Roden's account, while second-hand, is based on two sources, one local and the other, coming from the Scottish expert in Celtic studies, John Campbell. However, his writing also comes with a health warning. Jocelyn was a religious fundamentalist and one-time Grand Master of the Orange Order. His account includes descriptions of the islanders as a wild race and semi-barbarous. The following year, 1852, Harriet Martineau, a somewhat more trustworthy source, travelled through Ireland. In a letter written from Ackle Island in September 1852, she would describe Inishki as the poorest place in Ireland and claimed, The people worship a stone, dressing it in woollen and praying to it for wrecks. Having read all these, I was pretty sure there was something to the rumours. They were coming from too many diverse sources to be purely the invention of these visitors. And as I continued to trace the island's history through the closing decades of the 19th century, more specific details emerged, with one source providing a history of the stone, claiming it was older than anyone could remember, at least 100 years old, and had begun when a girl was caught in a storm but found safety under the stone. 
more recent historians, particularly Brian Dornan, have been able to put together a more accurate sense of what this stone, called the Naevogue, was and what it was for. It seems to have had a human shape, possibly that of a woman. It was, as the early accounts mention, wrapped in a flannel shroud, which according to some was renewed each year. The ritual appears to have involved dipping the stone in the ocean and the islanders considered it to have powers to influence the potato harvest or quell a storm, but not, as the sensationalised accounts infer, to wreck ships on their coasts. By the 20th century, the stone was no longer being used. Continued press attention saw the Catholic Church redouble its efforts to stop the islanders engaging in the ritual. It appears a priest broke the Naevogue and tossed the pieces into the sea off the South Island at some point in the later years of the 19th century. Given all this evidence, it surely seems obvious then that the claims the islanders were pagans were true. I have to say, I'm not entirely convinced. I believe the accounts, but would still be slow to label the islanders as pagans. I think the use of the term pagan probably says more about our desire to see the island as mystical and backwards than an actual reflection of island life. This can be best understood by looking at the other rumour that swirled around the island, that is that they were pirates. But before we go into this, I'm going to take a quick break. Today's show is brought to you by irishnewspaperarchives.com. The archive, as I've said before, is one of the best resources out there for folks like you and me who are fans of Irish history. Something I really like about the site is that they have a great browse feature where you can go back and scroll through newspapers from a given date. It's a really great way to get an insight into the world of our ancestors and get a sense of what was happening in the past. Actually, it's how this podcast started. I was browsing through the papers in 1927 when I came across stories about Inish Gee. The archive is packed full of similar fascinating accounts you rarely find in books. IrishNewspaperArchives.com are now offering you, the listeners of the Irish History Podcast, a great offer of 30% off monthly and yearly packages. As someone who uses the archive a lot and used it long before they sponsored the show, I can't recommend it enough. So go now to irishnewspaperarchives.com and use the coupon code POD30 where you'll get 30% off, that's 30% off monthly and yearly packages. Don't miss out, so go to irishnewspaperarchives.com forward slash podcast and use that coupon code POD30. While the spiritual beliefs of the Inishki Islanders are at times hard to decipher, the story of piracy on Inishki is a lot more straightforward. It unquestionably happened, but to understand it, we need to dispel any stereotypes we might have of men with wooden legs or eye patches. When precisely piracy began is not clear. The first recorded incident dates from 1834 when a ship floundered off the coast of the North Island. The Islanders did help the crew, but pillaged the ship of its valuables. This to me seems more like opportunism than piracy, but there are much clearer examples from the Great Famine. While the population of the Inishkees increased during the late 1840s, the islanders do seem to have suffered because in 1847 and 1848, they, like many other coastal communities in northwest Mayo, raided food ships passing by the coast. In the most famous incident, which took place in July 1847, the islanders had the misfortune of attacking the vessel the Emily Maria as it sailed down the west coast. They surrounded the ship with numerous curracks and then proceeded to board it looking for food. Unbeknownst to them, the authorities had taken precautions for precisely such an event and there were several marines on board. In the following fracas, the marines shot and killed four islanders and wounded many more. This would prove to be one of the most famous incidents of piracy off the Inishkees, but certainly not the only one. There were several more in 1847 and 1848. However, this series of raids was relatively short-lived. The opening of a Coast Guard station on the island in 1849, precisely to stop these raids, had the desired effect. However, ten years later, that Coast Guard station closed in 1859, and almost immediately there was a rise in piracy. While this seems like opportunism on the part of the islanders, their motivation was actually hunger. While the islanders had survived the Great Famine, the late 1850s and early 1860s proved a far more difficult time for them. 
Life on the islands had always been a delicate balance where they were at the mercy of nature. This was brutally displayed on June 4th, 1858 when a violent storm caused mayhem. A letter sent by the islanders to the Lord Lieutenant told a sorry tale. A tremendous storm which caused the sea to dash over the potato crops and which did dreadful destruction to them, so much so that an appearance of the stalk is not left to be seen. We expected the crops to recover, but alas, we are now lost, for instead of recovering, the very roots in the ground decayed. Our entire means on which we and our families depend destroyed. We implore your excellency to make endowments as a means to support a number of over 300 beings on an island in the western ocean. This account was supported by the coast guard, the school teacher, the parish priest, along with one of the local poor law guardians. The situation was very extreme and triggered a wider crisis on the islands. The islanders slaughtered animals to survive and their herds shrank in size affecting them in the long term. Over the coming years the crisis worsened with the appearance of blight on the potato crop in 1860. Facing destitution the islanders turned to piracy with the earliest attack I could find in this phase taking place on May 8th to May 9th 1860 when the ship the Hoach St. Lotlinger was lying off the coast. Around 10pm the vessel was surrounded by smaller boats and the islanders boarded the ship breaking open the hatches and systematically emptied the hold of Indian corn for three hours. The islanders Edward Lavelle and Charles Ty were arrested and found guilty but mercy was asked for on account of the hunger on the islands. The judge accepted this but said it was no excuse and the men were given custodial sentences with hard labour. Repression though could not triumph over hunger and in June 1862 a ship, the Jewess, was boarded by 40 men who threatened to run it aground if the crew resisted. They successfully made away with 12 tonnes of corn on this occasion. A month later a coal vessel was passing by the increasingly dangerous waters around Inishki when it was attacked. However, the islanders had no interest in coal. They wanted food and simply took what provisions were on board, leaving the coal behind. The police would raid the Inishki Islands after this, but found nothing. By early 1863, conditions on the islands were appalling. A report stated there were 56 families with nothing in the world to depend on. The relieving officer met the persons whose hands, feet, face and eyes were enormously swollen from want and starvation. The islanders had received £20 in aid in April 1863 but this did little to help the hungry because a vessel off Blacksod Bay was attacked by over 50 people not long afterwards. When they found it to be another coal transport they left but the captain took pity on their plight and gave them what bread and tobacco he could. The following day a large number of men attacked the ship the Laurel in the same area. The captain on this occasion offered money but all the islanders wanted was food and they took 20 tonnes of corn the Laurel was carrying. Piracy off the coast of Inishki continued and in May 1865 the vessel the Elizabeth McClure was travelling from Liverpool to the port of Westport. On the night of May the 22nd she was lying off the coast of Inishki when 16 canoes and a boat containing in total 50 men boarded the vessel. If they were resisted they threatened to cut the rigging and sails and they were able to get 18 to 20 tonnes of maize off the vessel. Changes in the island's fortunes and economy coupled with increasing coast guard patrols brought piracy finally to an end. But there's no question it had been a feature of life on the Inishkees as late as the 1860s. Therefore there is clear evidence that the two wildest rumours about life on the Inishki, those of piracy and strange religious practices were true. This certainly reinforces the idea that the islands were actually strange, mysterious and almost mythical. However, this, as I alluded to earlier, is probably more about the way we want to interpret these actions and want to see the islands rather than what was the reality of life there. When we dig deeper and ask the questions why were the islanders engaged in piracy and unorthodox religious beliefs, the answers, for me anyway, were not very mysterious, exotic or mystical. They were pretty straightforward. Both were shaped by what was often a very harsh struggle to live in what was a difficult environment where human survival could not be taken for granted. As I mentioned earlier, the communities on the Inishki Islands were among the most remote in Ireland. Not only were they geographically remote, but the isolation was enhanced in winter, when it was simply not possible to travel to or leave the islands for long periods of time. An early reference to the islands by William Maxwell in his 1832 book Wild Sports of the West described the conditions the islanders lived in. A boat may approach Inishki in the full confidence of a settled calm and before an hour a gale may come on, 
that will render any chance of leaving it impractical, and weeks will elapse occasionally before an abatement of the storm would allow the imprisoned stranger to quit those dangerous shores. The isolation had a dramatic impact on all aspects of life and left the islanders with the need to be self-sufficient in all matters, both spiritual and material. Alexander in his Shand spoke of this when he said in 1884 that the islands were almost an independent state, and in many ways they had to be. In terms of religion, there was no resident cleric on the Inishkees. The islanders were Catholic, and on occasion a priest would travel out performing marriages and baptisms. However, months in winter must have passed by with no priest, and I think this probably goes a long way to explaining why they worshipped the stone, the Neavog. Faced with the difficult life at the best of times and with no resident priest, they may well have adopted the Neavog as something of a replacement to rely on in times of need. This also wasn't that unusual when you think that people the world over, including Catholics across Ireland, have long venerated statues and used them as a focus for rituals to invoke the intervention of a higher being they believed in. The islanders do not appear to have seen the Nave Vogue and their veneration of it as separate to their Christianity, but rather part of it. When they used it in rituals, they said seven Our Fathers, seven Hail Marys and seven Glorias, all common Catholic prayers. They were also by no means hostile to the church. While clerics and priests were not part of the fabric of day-to-day -day life on the island, neither were the British authorities. The arrival of the Coast Guard in 1849 was the first permanent presence of government representatives on the island and their stay was pretty short-lived. They left again in 1859. In the absence of official authorities, it is unsurprising then that the islanders resorted to their own structures. One example of this was the king mentioned earlier in the podcast. These individuals were not monarchs in the way that we understand them, but rather community leaders. In fact, they were the opposite of what we think of when we talk of kings. As one political scientist said, they were more like a form of self-government. The title was not hereditary and the king in many cases emerged naturally over a long period of time. Neither was this form of self-organisation unique to Inishki. Caesar Otway encountered similar figures in Eris in mainland Mayo in the 1840s. They remained a feature of community life into the late 19th century in more isolated communities such as Port Erlen, not far from Inishki, Guidor in Donegal, the Aran Islands, Inishark and even Clada, a fishing village in what was then the outskirts of Galway City. Indeed, there is still a king of Tory Island, which is off the coast of Donegal. The existence of a king was often used to bolster arguments that the islanders were somehow backwards, but this completely misunderstands the role. Many island communities had continued to use a system of farming called Rundale, which saw lands rotated between families, and this needed a figure, often the king, to oversee this rotation. Kings were also figures who could negotiate with outside authorities on behalf of the islanders. Meanwhile, the development of piracy is also a reflection of island life and the difficulties it posed. It can be best understood by looking at it as a way of surviving in desperate times rather than a reflection of mysterious, dangerous islanders. In general, the economy of the islands was far more developed than outsiders ever imagined or gave it credit for. Time and again, outsiders, few of whom ever visited the island, or, if they did, spent long enough there to understand it, stated that the islanders lived hand-to-mouth on a diet of potatoes. A recent study by Brian Dornan, however, has shown that this is not the case at all. While potatoes were eaten locally, they were grown as a cash crop as well and sold in Belmullet, the closest market on the mainland. The islanders also grew rye and other crops for food and in general they seem to have enjoyed a more diverse diet than many on the mainland, something that helped them get through the Great Famine. Meanwhile, cash crops such as potatoes were not the only way the islanders engaged in the wider economy. Their distance from the authorities also allowed the islanders to distill putching, an illegal alcohol made from potatoes. This appears to have been exported given it was known across the wider region as being of very high quality. However, rather than looking at this as evidence of economic activity, it's often used to bolster stereotypes of wild, barbarous islanders in the mould of bootleggers. While the island was far more developed in the 19th century, they still faced crises as we have seen, and these were the root of piracy on the island. Having developed a high level of independence over the decades, they refused on several occasions to seek aid in the workhouse on the mainland. This is understandable, not only because workhouses were notorious by the 1850s given over 300,000 people had died in them during the Great Famine, but the island was where they lived their lives and it was there they chose to struggle through adversity. 
It was only in these circumstances where the island could no longer provide for them that they resorted to piracy. Indeed, in court cases arising from these incidents, judges acknowledged hunger was the motivating factor. Our tendency to sensationalise this piracy with misty-eyed romanticism only serves to obscure our understanding of life on the Inishkees and how resilient, adaptable and ultimately successful the islanders were. A crude test of any community's success is its population and its ability to reproduce itself. In the late 19th century, the wider province of Connacht was no longer able to survive as it had due to the horrors of the Great Famine, but Inishkee thrived in these years, which was no small achievement. The islanders utilised the resources available to them to the maximum and turned what could have been a very difficult situation to their own advantage. In 1841, the island's population had stood at 237. Except for a very difficult period in the 1860s, the population rose decade on decade, increasing by 30% by 1911. In the same period, the population of Connacht fell by a staggering 56%. The islanders, often depicted as backwards, undeveloped savages, were clearly quite the opposite. Their ability to adapt and diversify to a rapidly changing world around them was illustrated in 1908 when they not only engaged with but managed to cut a pretty profitable deal from a short-lived whaling station that opened up off the South Island. The portrayal of life on Inishki and indeed in many rural communities even in the 21st century remains one based on lazy stereotypes that invokes life as simple, mysterious, even magical but yet with a tinge of danger. The reality is very different. Life on Inishki was not mysterious, but was a fascinating example of human adaptability and a struggle to survive in one of the most difficult environments imaginable. The mystery in this story is one created by outsiders and is not an accurate reflection of island life itself. Overall, this podcast is a simplified version of the story of the history of Inishki. It's obviously far more complex. The later history of how the island ended up being abandoned in the 1930s is fascinating and the next episode, which is exclusively for patrons at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast, is on that very story, the decline of the islands. In the meantime, if you want to find out more, I would recommend Brian Dornan's Mayo's Lost Island as a great place to start reading on the islands. Until next time, Sloan.